uh, a volunteer as well as uh, one of the researchers at the St. Charles County Historical Society. I uh, helped write the, uh, uh, the article that appeared in July Heritage, and uh, I have already gotten some feedback from the uh, from the article, and I thank you very much for that. Uh, also, uh, we have a second, uh, it's a three-parter, so there will be a second uh, feature about the church, mainly interviews with some of the members of the church. Uh, that will appear in our October issue. And in January, uh, the focus will be on the building of this current building here, uh, which took place back in 1956. Uh, I am also a, an alumnus of Lindenwood University. Actually, then, back then it was Lindenwood College. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been quite a homecoming for me. But also, I've also had some memories of this particular church even before that. Heritage, which is the July edition, which has the uh, it's the cover story of uh, the uh, beginnings of the uh, Presbyterian Church. And uh, it is an honor to speak to all of you today. And uh, as I mentioned, I have me been a member of the St. Charles County Historical Society for 35 years, and I have researched many subjects of St. Charles history. When I found out that the St. Charles Presbyterian Church was celebrating its 200th anniversary, I wanted to help research and write what has become quite a history of a great church and the oldest Protestant church in St. Charles. I have a few personal memories of this church. Uh, Fifty years ago, in September, uh, next month, I was a student in Lindenwood's Child Laboratory School. I started as a preschooler in 1968, and I was at this church until 1970. The Child Laboratory School was established by Lindenwood as part of the, their child development program, and it was established in the school in 1960. It later moved to another part of the campus in 1971. But later after high school, I attended Lindenwood College as a college student seeking a degree in communications and journalism. I had worked at KCLC and I also contributed to the college newspaper known at the time in the 80s as the Lindenwood Ledger. I had the privilege of writing many articles concerning the Presbyterian Church. One was when the uh, Lindenwood, college, uh, campus, uh, Lindenwood College campus chaplain was established and that was uh, an interview with Pastor George Wilcox who was uh, also part of this church. I believe I had at least two, maybe three interviews with him during my college years, and I know one of them was my first assignment for the Lindenwood Ledger, and the other two was for uh, KCLC. During my college years, I considered the Presbyterian Church as my church home, but I was never confirmed, nor was I an official member of the church. But if you attend Lindenwood, and the college was very much home to me, included was the St. Charles Presbyterian Church. This church here in St. Charles has quite a history, going back 200 years. It did start with the Lindsays, it was, it was, that is Thomas Lindsay and his wife Margaret Beckett Lindsay. There was also James Lindsay and his wife Charlotte. There were, they were the core of the organizing group of St. Charles residents who began the St. Charles Presbyterian Church. Others in the group included Ebenezer Ayers and his wife Deborah. There was Elizabeth Emmons, John Bracken, and Theopolis McPheeters. The first Presbyterian Church in Missouri was established by Reverend Salmon, Get Salmon Giddings, who organized the first church in St. Louis in 1817. This was the beginning of many congregations in Missouri, which included the St. Charles Presbyterian Church. Today's Presbytery in the southeastern corner of Missouri, which includes St. Charles and the greater St. Louis area, would be known as the Giddings Lovejoy Presbytery. Lovejoy is a very important name, and we will talk about him a little later. The actual 200th anniversary date of the First Presbyterian Church 
here in St. Charles was August 30th of 1818, when Reverend Charles Stibbings Robinson was the first pastor of the new church, and he arrived in December of 1818. A year later, Reverend Robinson helped organize the Garden Presbyterian Church, which will be celebrating their 200th anniversary next year. And in 10 years, the Presbyterian Church grew in numbers. And Reverend Robinson died uh, 10 years later in 1828. But in the beginning, the church would be meeting at people's homes. There wasn't a permanent building for the, in the first 13 years. And that is when George and Mary Sibley came in. George Sibley was an explorer, served as an agent for the government under President Thomas Jefferson, working with the Indians in the territory, first at Fort Belfontin and later at Fort Osage. George Mary, Mary Easton, and both settled in St. Charles, and Mary Easton established a school for women, which would become Lindenwood. Mary Sibley became a member of the church first. It would be four years before George would join, but George would be involved in the effort to build an actual church building that was named, and he did this prior to his membership. That started in 1832 to find a permanent location. Between 1832 and 1833, subscriptions were taken for the first building of the church. By June 4th of 1833, the subscribers held a meeting where George Sibley and H. H. Wardlaw were authorized to take charge and create a church building, collecting the first installment on the subscription papers. They also had the responsibility of selecting the site, determining its size, and organizing its plans for construction. Between the planning and the existence of the building, there was a terrible epidemic of cholera which struck St. Charles, and that included the congregation. Before construction of the actual church, the cemetery was established and fenced in. So the cemetery came first, and then the church building. The first church was located at the corner of 3rd and Madison Streets, on the southwest corner, which is now occupied by the St. Joseph Health Center. After completion, it was known by many names, including Church on the Hill, but it was most popularly known as the Old Blue Church. The color of the windows gave a blue cast to the building. It gave the building its namesake. Earlier, I mentioned the name of Lovejoy, and that is Elijah Lovejoy, who was a close friend of the Reverend Warren Nichols, who was pastor in 1833. Lovejoy was licensed to preach on April 13th of that year as an ordained minister from the Princeton Theological Cemetery in New Jersey. Lovejoy was in St. Charles, courting Celia and French. They were married in St. Charles in March of 1835. Lovejoy was more known for his writing and his essays, and he was the editor of the Christian Observer, which was a newspaper he established here in St. Louis. The Christian Observer published many viewpoints on slavery and its campaign to abolish slavery in the U.S. The Old Blue Church was completed in 1837, and right after completion, Reverend Lovejoy preached what became his two now famous sermons against slavery at that church. Those two sermons, along with his continued publishing of his anti-slavery viewpoints in the Christian Observer, the church and the St. Charles community itself became vastly divided over the issue of slavery. On October 3rd of 1837, after his second sermon, an angry mob gathered there to be at that evening at the house where Lovejoy was staying. Today, it is where Golden Printing is located, at the corner of Main and First Capitol Drive, or what was then known as the corner of Main and Clay. The mob demanded that he leave immediately, and Lovejoy had to decide, and to him, St. Charles was his home. He wanted to remain in town, but because of the fierceness of the mob and the pleadings of his friends and family, he secretly left the house and went to the home of George and Mary Sibley. They allowed Lovejoy to stay the night at their house. The following day, George gave Lovejoy a horse and hired a guide, his name was S. S. Watson, to accompany Lovejoy out of town. 
both Watson and Lovejoy traveled to Alton, Illinois, where he reunited with Reverend Warren Nichols, who was now a pastor in Alton. Just five weeks later, Lovejoy was mobbed again. They, this time, <coughs> he couldn't escape. Lovejoy's printing press was destroyed, and Lovejoy himself was murdered. To writers and journalists today, we consider Lovejoy to be one of the first martyrs and defenders of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which is the right to free speech and a free press. There were many other issues that divided the Presbyterian Church in the United States, but slavery was the leading, leading issue. The St. Charles Church was caught in the middle of this, these issues and controversies, and it continued for three long decades. In 1857, the Presbyterian Church itself was divided into two churches. The Southern New School Presbyterians formed the United Synod of the South. Just after the Civil War broke in 1861, the Old School Southern Presbyterians formed the Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States of America. And after the Civil War, they renamed themselves the Presbyterian Church in the United States. The Old Blue Church itself was divided. The congregation had outgrown the church, and the Old Blue Church was vacated in 1866. With the continued divided sympathy between the North and the South, the St. Charles Presbyterian Church divided into the Northern and Southern churches. One of the Southern Presbyterian churches was built at Fifth and Madison Streets in 1920. It's today where it's a parking lot, but before that it was where the uh, St. Charles Post Office was. The Northern Presbyterians established their church on Jefferson Street between 5th and 6th. Many remember the Northern Church building, which was built in 1906 and had originally had tall steeples, but those steeples were lost in a 1911 storm. Just after World War II, the two churches in St. Charles began to look toward the future and both wanted to mend fences and end the controversies that divided them a century ago. In 1948, both the northern and southern churches reunited to become one church. One of the problems they encountered was that both church buildings were inadequate for the large congregation. As St. Charles was expanding beyond Kings Highway and beyond Lindenwood College, the church itself investigated a new site for a new United Presbyterian Church. At the same time, Lindenwood College also looked for a new location of having a chapel, since Sibley Hall was also too small for an expanding student population. Since Lindenwood and the Presbyterian Church were affiliated and had historical connections, it was quite a fit that the church purchased the property at the corner of Sibley and Gamble Streets, next door to Lindenwood. Dr. Frank McClure, who was president of Lindenwood at the time, Dr. Homer Clevenger, the history professor at Lindenwood, a former mayor of St. Charles, and a past president of the St. Charles County Historical Society, worked with the Reverend Thomas C. Cannon, who was the pastor of the newly merged church in establishing a modern Presbyterian church for a large congregation. The fundraising began in 1954, in, as far as in January of that year, and construction began in November of that same year. The church, with all of its modern architectural features that you see in modern churches after World War II and in an expanding St. Charles, was completed in 1957. As I mentioned before, my first experience with this modern church was in 1968. I began my formal education in this church. This church was Lindenwood's home to the Child Laboratory School, as I mentioned. And when they built this church, Lindenwood needed to expand themselves, and they established a space for the study of childhood development. And this is why you see two-way mirrors in one of the uh, classrooms upstairs. Many St. Charles residents had children who attended the school, some of them not 
part of the Presbyterian Church, but they were part of the St. Charles community. It was where I spent my preschool year and my kindergarten. I remember being on the second floor in one big room, as I mentioned, with the two way mirrors, which later that was where the people, uh, the students who were studying uh, child development were observing us. And kindergarten was advanced. They had a reading program, so we were reading, uh, we were reading ourselves, and I was quite a reader back then. I was here until 1970, and at the same time that I was here, uh, there were several buildings that were under construction at Lindenwood. Two wings of what became the Butler Library, which is now uh, being re renovated for something else, was built. The Young Science Hall, also on Watson Street, was being built. And then there was the new Fine Arts Building, which is now Harmon Hall, and that was under construction in 1969. One memory that I remember from 1970 in my kindergarten year was that my kindergarten teacher brought in a TV set and we were watching the splashdown of Apollo 13 in the classroom in the church building. And as a kindergartner, I really didn't understand what was going on, except that something had happened with that mission because they didn't go to the moon. I remember many students that were there and some of them I have been in contact with recently, either through the Historical Society or social media. But 12 years after kindergarten and going through the St. Charles Public Schools, I graduated from St. Charles West. I returned to Lindenwood as a college student. And I really enjoyed working as a writer, learning how to write for a newspaper, learning how to be a broadcast journalist. Nationwide, there was the establishment of the Presbyterian Church USA, which I had the privilege of covering that, which uh, this church became a member of that national organization. And it was a uniting of the northern and southern churches nationwide. I remember witnessing and reporting about the reunification, and there were several services and ceremonies that took place both at this church and at Lindenwood College. It was quite an experience, and this church, the congregation, and the National Church Establishment had a clear focus and a mission. The church in the 1980s and beyond continued to spread ministry throughout St. Charles and the area. In the St. Charles County Historical Society's quarterly journal called the St. Charles County Heritage, there is a three-part series that began in the July issue about the 200th anniversary of the church. The July article focuses on the establishment of the church. The October issue, uh, issue that will come up uh, next month, or in two months actually, will feature on some of the very noted people who have been longtime members of this church and the St. Charles community who shared some great stories and memories. And I, was in, I appreciated each and every one of them as I interviewed them. They were wonderful. The third article, which will be in our uh, January of 2019, will focus on the building of this church building and the efforts of not just this congregation and Lindenwood College, but the St. Charles community as well. And as I said, it has been quite an experience researching and interviewing and really remembering the memories of this church. Yeah, I consider this to be quite a homecoming. As I said, the last time I was actually in this sanctuary, it was 1986, and I attended my baccalaureate, which was held in this room when I graduated from Lindenwood. Over the years, I met many who have been members of this church, and one person I want to recognize right now is Kathy Landis, because uh, I remember she was at our quarterly meeting uh, about 12 months ago, actually, and uh, they had uh, announced that they were doing their 200th anniversary, and uh, I had approached Kathy and asked if uh, I could help in any way, and uh, she said, come on board, and I did. I want to wish a 200th anniversary to the St. Charles Presbyterian Church. There is quite a history of this church, and it's still really a good continuing focus on ministry. This church has quite a community, 
And all of us who have lived in St. Charles a long time have some sort of historical tie to this church. Thank you very much. One on Randolph, is that, you're, are you referring to the Mara Mayo Cemetery? Okay, yeah. Because you, you mentioned Dusabo, uh, the uh, founder of Chicago. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, that, it, it's, it is a good place, but again, I don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. 